Today, the rumble and swish of currents calls out to visitors of the White Salmon River. But for those with an ear for history, the canyon walls still echo with the sounds of spinning turbines, the hum of hydropower. You don't do a lake tap every day. These are very infrequent. We're now watching the river eat itself back into the sediments. One of the most spectacular things I've ever witnessed in my life. And just give it a few wraps around that cleat. Yeah. Within our power, we are going to try to capture every single fish. We won't, but we're going to do our best. These fish are extremely fragile. They get a little too much handling. Uh, they might die. Grab this one. This is a fish that's four and five years old. It, it's not something we take lightly. There's a reason these endangered salmon are getting a ride. Fire in the hole. Historically, you go back over 100 years ago, the white salmon flowed right through here. It was a neat little canyon. And in 1913, we built Condit Dam. Constructed to help electrify a developing region, Northwestern Lake and the dam that created it must come out. Condit Dam was completed in 1913. 12 and a half stories tall and 400 feet across, one of the largest of its era. As far as dam decommissioning, dam removals, this is one of the big ones. Glacier cold water plunging 45 miles from the river's source on the shoulders of Mount Adams was captured here, three miles above the White Salmon's confluence with the Columbia River. Condit was built to divert water from the reservoir into a mile-long wood pipeline that delivered it to a Pacific Corps powerhouse. At full capacity, two turbines produced about 14 megawatts, enough for 7,000 homes. There was just one problem, for fish. Fish can make it all the way up to the big plunge pool down at the base of the dam, and oftentimes when I'm standing up on the dam looking down, I can see them swimming around. A ladder providing fish with passage over the dam was part of the original structure, but a storm in the first year destroyed it. Later, a second ladder also washed out. In the 1990s, to reduce the dam's impact on fish, agencies required a costly passage system in the steep, narrow canyon as part of the new operating license. It was not a good deal for our customers. So for us, it was really a business decision to move towards decommissioning. Over 12 months, contractors must punch a hole into Condit and drain the lake. Then the dam can be demolished and its concrete used to recontour the site for planting with native species. As removal begins, the water level is lowered just 10 feet to keep the work area dry below the dam. But for lakeside residents who witnessed the drawdown, change was dramatic. Northwestern Lake became White Salmon River right before our eyes. It started to make a sound, and the sound was a sound of rapids, and it was sounding like a typical river. To empty the lake completely, workers drill and blast a tunnel through the base of the dam, a 90-foot thick wall of concrete built to endure the ages. We'll use probably about 3,000 pounds of explosives. This is something you can't you can't do incorrectly because you only get one shot at it. First of all, we have to design the number of holes that are needed to be drilled, the type of explosives that go into the hole, how much of each type of explosive that goes into the hole, and then it's, it's timing. Each of 15 blasts leading to the breach is a cascade of explosions, timed precisely to create an opening 18 feet wide, 13 feet tall sized in position to evacuate water and sediment quickly. It's going to be like pulling the plug on a bathtub. All the water behind me will drain down just like a bathtub would in about six hours. More than two million cubic yards of material has collected in the reservoir. And just behind the dam, a five-story wedge of silt. Much of this will also be on the move. 
there's no doubt that it's going to be a muddy river when this gets released. It's, it's going to have a consequence to the, the environment in the lower three miles of the river, but then it's going to be short-lived. Got a wild female. 91. Biologists have spent 60 months on a plan to protect salmon from sediment. And most of these fish are 25, 30. Uh, we moved a 45 pound fish. At the end of the day, I am absolutely exhausted. Tule Fall Chinook are also known as white salmon. These are descendants of the ancient wild creatures for which the river is named. They're big because they had to move big cobble and big gravel. We have moved fish this year that have tails that are the size of both of my hands. Lewis and Clark, when they came through, they would have seen these fish being harvested in the mouth of the White Salmon River. Released above Condit, they will spawn in time to produce new generations emerging from the gravels after a century of absence, just as the dam disappears. When the dam comes out, the habitat for Thule Fall Chinook salmon will double. Biologists expect their numbers in the river, around 1,000 in a typical year, could also double. Coho and steelhead will increase too. While efforts to safeguard fish continue, a century of power production winds down. I have worked at this powerhouse for uh, 31 and a half years, most of a lifetime. The sound of the powerhouse is something you get used to and it's loud, yeah. It's a sad day, you know, I've been here 33 years and uh, it's been a great place to work. Tom Becker and Dennis Brower know how to repair and maintain everything in this building. Before moving on to a new assignment, they have one last job to do here. I do think about the powerhouse sometimes as, a, as, a, as an entity and uh, I talk to her sometimes. Uh. But the time for talk comes to an end. Turbines slow to a stop. You've done a good job for a long time and uh, you're gonna go to sleep now. Three minute warning. After months of precision blasting and boring into the base of Condit Dam, the last remaining 10 foot plug of concrete is laced with high explosives. Behind it, two miles of reservoir up to 10 stories deep, but only for a few moments more. The demolition crew triggers a final charge. We're now watching the river eat itself back into the sediments behind the dam, something that's happened much faster than we expected. If I had to come up with an analogy, it'd be like watching a fire. Geologic time seems to condense. The air holds an earthy aroma as water churns up organic material buried for nearly a century. The cascading sediment is exactly what planners counted on. The reservoir vanishes. A river canyon re-emerges in its place even more quickly than expected. Our prediction was it was going to be about six hours. In fact, it only took two hours for that lake to drain, and it, it really surprised me. I had someone come run up to me after the, the breach saying, hey, the lake's gone, and sure enough, there was the river. Now the focus must turn to undoing the dam, exactly 100 years after the start of construction. 
When workers arrived in 1912, they found a steep, rocky canyon. They had the same sort of access struggles that we are experiencing in the deconstruction part of the project. Heavy machinery was very limited. And basically, this project was made with hands and horses. As many as 1,500 men lived and labored here. One mess hall alone could seat 200. Building Conda Dam and, and this powerhouse was, at, for the time, a very Herculean effort. A 13-foot diameter pipeline to carry water from the reservoir to the powerhouse turbines was considered a technological wonder. It was a wood stay flow line, and it was over a mile long. It was the largest that had been built by that time. In the 21st century, it takes just one man in an excavator to erase the flow line. Grab what you can and pull the rod off, and then the wood just collapses. Our goal is to remove the wood, remove the steel out of the uh, footprint of the flume, and the concrete that's generated out of where the dam is will be laid back in to this footprint and then covered over with topsoil and replanted. Every single bit of this river is beautiful. Every single square inch of it. With the dam going out, it's a river that will run essentially wild from its beginnings up in the mountain down to the Columbia. It's pretty unique in that sense. But the dam will not give up its place easily. Crews strain to shatter resistant concrete. About 10,000 truckloads and five months of hammering will dislodge the dam to reach the river 125 feet below. I'm always impressed at how much has happened when I stand on top of the dam and look at it. When I get down here to take another perspective, it's like, wow, we've got a ways to go. These waters hold not one, but two dams. The second structure, hidden beneath the lake for nearly a century, is exposed. We've got a timber crib structure that was built with 14 by 14 timbers stacked like Lincoln logs. The issue with the coffer dam is we knew we had to remove it, but we really didn't know the extent of access issues that we would have trying to get down in here. We didn't know that until the reservoir was gone. The rock-filled mini dam created a dry work area for building conduit. It too must be taken out so returning fish have clear passage. You try and design and build management plans to, to deal with where you want to go, what you're trying to achieve, and then you get out on the ground and things change. Contractors must manage another complex part of the project, restoring a two-mile stretch of canyon, the former reservoir. Mature plants that once grew along its shoreline, like this willow, are moved to the banks of the white salmon with a gardener's attention to detail. Just give it a good head start and a little pat on the ground and on to the next one, and that's proven uh, extremely effective. Planted with love. A canyon carpeted with orange markers gives way to 14,000 young trees a forest in the reservoir's old footprint. Dozens of acres go green as landscapers apply nearly one and a half tons of seed to hold in place new slopes with grass and shrubs. This is not your uh, mother's dump truck here. It's a pretty serious, heavy duty piece of construction equipment. Condit does not actually leave the valley. Instead, its new mission is to fill and recontour space once occupied by the flow line. Transformed into a grassy clearing in the woods. Crews roll out extended shifts to make the final push. The demo team provides an assist. The 
dam is gone. We have gotten in, we've removed everything. The river is free flowing through the former project site. My great grandfather fished this water. Uh, someday his great grandchildren and future generations will have that same opportunity. The white salmon is roused already by steelhead at BZ Falls. They're such athletes, they still have. They're just so strong. And to stand there and watch them make these jumps. Okay. Right here, up on the left. Yeah, there's another one right behind it. Fish experts have also arrived to scout the newly unharnessed waters and to document changes. There's salmon up and through the system. Uh, we just went by several reds or salmon nests that were in the river. Fish are actively passing upstream. And you would not know that there was a dam here unless you saw the, the grass and the way the moss is growing. The dam site, as you're coming towards it in a raft, it, it's hard to know where it was. The reservoir is rapidly becoming a memory too, beneath native shoots and buds establishing on the river corridor. This has been a long process with many stakeholders, lots of emotions and, and lots of views. Ultimately, removing Conda Dam was in the best interest of our customers, and I'm pleased that we were able to do so in a safe and efficient manner.